Welcome to the Subconscious Mind Mastery Podcast. Thomas Miller here. We're going to continue this theme that we've been talking about over the last several episodes. And even Fred's last episode, number 304, with the video from YouTube on muscle testing fits right into this theme beautifully, perfectly. We're going to continue talking about intuition. How do we connect to it? How do we hear it? And if we don't hear it, how can we develop it? And that is particularly the focus of this episode. So I have several thoughts on this. And first, I think we have to start with a question that many would ask. You you know, you go back to the episode that we did a couple back, the voice. Do you hear the voice? And not when your airplane is about to crash into the side of a mountain. I mean, do you hear it when you analyze a piece of food and say, is this the best thing for me to eat right now? Is that something that you could even get an intuitive feeling about without having to muscle test, without having to swing a pendulum, without having to draw a deck of cards? Is that just something that would be easily and readily available right here, right now? That's the goal. All right. So let's walk backwards from that. It can be there for all of us every day, I firmly believe. But this duality of our nature is masked by the other part of our nature, and that is our conscious monkey mind, if you will, that seems to work against it. All right, so let's take a couple of steps back here. And first of all, go all the way back. Is this something that some people are born with, and I just got the luck of the draw? I wasn't, so I have to try to figure it out. Me and Google, trying to navigate life. Well, yes and no. (laughs) I do think some are more inherently born with it. And where it shows up in astrology would be the moon, the sign Cancer, Neptune, and with that, the sign Pisces. So those are four areas of the chart. Now, for myself, I was born with my son, so that's who I am, literally in a direct line in the sky on the night I was born with Neptune. There's the psychic connection. But I'm not psychic. <laughs> I mean, I'd, I've i never seen a spirit. You know, Majana now, on the other hand, her aspects are not as strong, but she was born seeing spirits since a child. I went back and looked at some aspects in her chart uh, before doing this and saw that very clearly with fresh eyes that her chart shows that not only does she have the connection, but she could use it professionally, and she is. That's the Life After Life podcast, if you'd like to check that out, particularly if you've recently lost someone special to you. That's an excellent resource to keep in mind. So, yes, it is something that I think some people are born with those areas more activated. But look, you have four points in your astrological chart, including one of the most important ones, the moon. You've got a pretty good chance that you're not deprived of this ability. Let's just put it that way. You have it in there. It's just a matter of where, to what degree, and how you are supposed to use it. While we're mentioning other podcasts, I have the Fun Astrology podcast, and on that website, funastrology.com, we have three readers you can avail yourself of. And then the other podcast is the Robert Glasscock Old Soul, New Soul Astrology podcast, and Robert is booking readings. So there are great resources there for you to avail yourself of. If you'd like somebody to sit down and say, hey, show me where my intuition capabilities are, that would be the way to do it. Now, here's a question, too, that really parlays this strongly and quickly. If you were born with it, have you pushed it down or pushed it away at some point? I hear that theme many times from many people. It either frightens us, we don't know what to do with it, or it shows up as incomplete. That is, to our monkey mind, to our analytical mind, we think, oh, wait a minute, you didn't give me the whole story. No, it rarely does give us the whole story. Well, if at some point, maybe even as a child, maybe even out of your conscious recollection, you stuffed it, and then now you're trying to walk on the spiritual path, you'd like to access it, but it's pushed down, and you've put many layers on top of that. So we have to reemerge it. We have to 
clear the way so that the root can spring up above the ground again. We're going to circle back on those points. Just hold them as possibilities and think about what of those might be applicable in your own life if you don't hear the voice. Now, let's take another tact at this. When are times that the voice is there for us in our lives? I mean, what are we talking about here? What kind of scope of reference or what should I expect this connection to be? Does it just show up in emergencies, like the TWA Flight 800 example that I like to use, where a lady approached the boarding gate and then suddenly put on the brakes and said, I'm not getting on that airplane? You've heard other similar stories. A wife will call her husband who is heading to the airport and say, don't take the plane that you're thinking about taking. The wise husband listens. There's always another flight, even if there's a question and you don't have to know the rest of the story. It may not be that that airplane crashes, but it might be that the car that you would have rented at that time could have gotten into a head-on collision. You just don't know. What about major directions in life? There's another time that the voice can show up. For me, when I met the mother of my kids, I got an intuitive prompt right the very first day. No, we were trying to be set up by her family who I was close to in Tulsa. No. Well, I went on, and there was a lot of karma that came out of that. Fred Dodson's email this guy about doing his audiobooks. Both pivotal directions. One I did not listen to, and it changed my life. One I did listen to, and it changed my life. And then there can be minor directions, like my little Aspen ski story. Don't reach in and get your phone to take that picture And it's not the phone that fell, it was my glove that fell, and I had to go retrieve it. Then there was another Aspen incident that I haven't made public, but it was a clear instruction that I didn't do, and there was a consequence. I think of Jean, who wrote an email at a prompt to ask if I would want to house sit. And that was, I wouldn't say that was a minor direction, that was probably more under the major direction categories, but for her, she got her house sitting covered. That's all she wanted was her cats to be taken care of and and the house to be cared for while they were away on spring break. For me, it was a definite fork in the road, and I was able to continue that on to this place where I am now in western North Carolina. That was from an intuitive prompt. And then we can bring it down even to -to day-to-day directions. Like I mentioned before, is this the best substance or food, nourishment, drink to put into my body right now? Is this activity or this person or this relationship or this whatever fill in your own blank, is it my best highest timeline to engage in this now? So you can either get an intuitive feeling or if you're learning to walk, you know, we how do we learn to ride the bicycle? Then you can use Fred's video from episode 304 to help muscle test around these things. That's a way to tune in to the same thing. The feeling is simply a more developed version of the muscle testing. It still shows up in your body. It's just how you're plugging into it. It's what radio device are you listening to? Are you listening to a radio, an old-fashioned radio in the room? Or do you have symphonic earbuds in and you're tuned into a high definition or high fidelity podcast or music source? You see what I'm saying, right? It's just, it's the same message. It's just coming at you in different ways. Now, two audiobooks from Fred the Intuitive Awareness Method and Intuition Training are both books that would be incredibly valuable for you in moving this forward. I've got to say here, I, you know, this is a point where when I talk to people about this and they want to develop their intuition, and one of the things I will usually ask, because these are incredible resources and they're already out there, they've been out there, they're there for you to utilize. And I will say, have you listened to the audiobooks? Well, no. Or, well, I started one, but I haven't finished it. That right there tells me that you're not serious. I came across my big Rubbermaid tub or Sterilite, whatever, whichever brand it is, that I have all my journals in from when I did all this work. It's literally one of those big tubs about half full. Journals of various sorts and sizes, all of them written in fully. 
and most of that work was done over the course of about 12 to 18 months. I digested it. I mean, I did the work. So when I hear people say, well, yeah, I started it, but I didn't finish it, well, then that's where they are in the process. And we don't have much else to talk about until you get serious. And that's not trying to be mean. That's trying to say, you have got to do this work with a passion, with a determination, with a goal in mind, with an intention to guide you. And to say, well, I started an audio book, but I didn't finish it. You don't have any of those at your, at your beckon. You are not using the forces that will move you toward getting your goal in anything. All right. So enough said on that. But if you really are serious about this, it's going to take some work. You've got to put the time in. Now, let's examine another angle. What would block the voice? Well, my top answer to that, I think, would have to be noise of all sorts and kinds. Now, this is not to say that you have to sit in silence like a Tibetan monk in order for this to work. Not at all. That doesn't work for me, in fact. However, how much noise do you have in your life? Are you able to find quiet, peaceful, retreated times, either in your home, on a walking trail in your neighborhood, on a bicycle ride, out in nature, on a hiking trail, sitting beside a creek or a lake or a pond, taking a drive on one of your favorite roads, and not with anything on, just you and yourself and your thoughts and your presence, both sides of your nature, there together, without a lot of other interference. See, I think we have too much noise in our world, and when we get into silence or when we get into quiet, we have to put something on because we can't be still. We can't stand being quiet. We can't stand not having noise. You can't go eat now without noise. I mean, it's in the other patrons in the restaurant, and then in order to crank up the, the level, they play music or have televisions on. Not one television, sometimes 14 it's all noise. Go to the airport. It's noise. And I will tell you, because my life, if you were to follow me around, I don't have a lot of noise around during the day. I don't play music in the background unless it's special. I mean, I typically I'm able to sit in silence and a lot of stuff comes through when you're in that condition. And when you get into a noisy environment, it's a shock. It's like, oh, I can't handle this. I can't even think. I can't hear. I can't talk. Well, it's the same in reverse. When you're conditioned to noise and you get into silence, it's a shock. So you have to ease yourself back in to either environment. Like I would have to ease myself back into being comfortable in restaurants. Somebody says, hey, let's go have lunch. I'm like, okay, what park? <laughs> they look at you like you came out of Mars, you know? Now, winter's coming and won't be able to do this for a while, but you get the idea. I mean, when you say, what park are we going to go eat lunch in? Well, we're going to be in nature, except for the noise of traffic. We're going to be in fairly quiet environment, hopefully. We're going to be able to hear each other talk. And if you're tuned into nature, then you're going to be more grounded and centered anyway for the meeting. So let's take both sides of this, because for some, too much silence could also disturb any idea that there was going to be a message coming through. So I think you have to find the right balance and environment for you. That's between stillness, physical stillness versus physical movement. That's level of noise versus level of silence. You have to find your own balance. Now, here's another one. And this was a big one for me in Aspen. And that was simply turning down the monkey mind. You have to presume that that voice is in you. It's part of you. It's part of your divine nature. The problem is our monkey mind has so suppressed that little voice. Think of a great big hammer and a little bitty nail, and you have an anvil. And the little bitty nail tries to stand its little self up, and it wants to be heard, but the great big hammer... Boom! Slams down on the nail, flattens it to nothing and says, I've got this. I'm in control. I'm the one that's going to call the shots. You're just a nail. Well, 
How many times is that little nail going to try to put itself back together? Boom! There it comes again. Boom! And see, we do that over and over and over. And our little fragile connection to the home office just gets shattered. So your intuitive voice might be like a very flattened out nail sitting on top of an anvil. Using that analogy, what I got to was the point where I negotiated with myself to say, all right, Thomas, you have two parts of you. You have the nail and there's this dominant hammer. Hammer, are you willing to give the nail a chance to speak? Are you willing to let it stand up its little self and have a voice? And the hammer would say, yes, sure, why not? If that's the voice that can hear around the corner, it says, oh, gee, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that that could, that the nail could actually see the future. Well, yeah, I, I, sure. Well, then what I did <laughs> out there on those hiking trails, see, acknowledging both sides, like acknowledging that there's a nail, acknowledging that there's a hammer. One is more dominant than the other in our, in our natural state. But to say, hammer, look, the nail has things that you don't have. And saying to the nail, the hammer has things you don't have. But instead of acting like a dog and a cat or a cat and a parakeet here, let's act harmoniously. Are you willing to cooperate with each other? Because, and I told them both this, I'd say, hammer, I would really rather have the nail driving this show, being in the position that you have occupied. Now, that's not to minimize you. I'm not saying to go away, and I don't want to flatten you out like the poor little nail has been, because you're valuable too. So when the nail gives us direction, when we know where we're going, then, yeah, I want you hammering on that anvil to give us the next steps, to move things forward, to get things going dynamically and powerfully. But let's let the nail guide where we're going or where we're hammering or what we're forming the thing into. So I would get out there on the hiking trail, which put me in my best Zen zone, and I would start walking, and I would say, Hammer, are you willing to be quiet? Are you willing to stand aside? Are you willing not to slam down on the anvil until we get to that tree up there? Yes, certainly. All right, Nail, you are now invited to speak. <laughs> and that's where I laugh, because I wouldn't get five or ten steps. Bam! Pound! Boom! Bang! And the poor little nail is flattened back out on that, an on that anvil. You know, it's like, oh, Hammer was say, I've got work to do. <laughs> I'm just trying to help. Well, I would stop and I would say, wait, we have a deal. Negotiating still with these two inner parts of Thomas. And as you know, I've told this story a number of times. That dance would continue until finally... We would get agreement enough and the hammer would slow down enough, not swing, until I got to that tree or that rock. And then eventually I could get further. And then eventually, over time, I could get to the whole trail. And then eventually the shift happened where the nail now drives the show and the hammer comes into action after we know what direction we're going. So now... That's my default state. I think once you make the shift, then you've got it. Oh, no, there are times where the hammer gets big again. Like when I was moving, when I moved into Lord Jupiter, for example, and had that little T-bone in the back uh, accident where the guy ran into me from behind, that happened to just slow me down because I'd let the hammer get way out of balance. So I'm actually thankful that there is some kind of mechanism in place that I could count on that is going to guide me back. All right, let's tackle a couple of others here, and then we're going to start talking about what we can do. So another block could be, and this one could be deeper than you think, subconsciously, you might not be willing. You might say you're willing, but subconsciously, you're not willing. Subconsciously, you really want to stay in control. You don't want to surrender it to an unknown, ambiguous, unproven commodity, even if it was part of yourself, something that you're not familiar with. Oh, no, I'm not letting control go. Oh, I might say I want to. Yes, I want to be spiritual. Yes, I want to do the thing. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. Deep inside, not going to happen. 
Here's another one. Maybe you've argued with it in the past, and there is some past instruction or guidance that is unfulfilled. This one is especially powerful when that unfulfilled guidance can still be fulfilled. If it's a closed door, then it's just cleaning it up with the past and you move on. But if there is some guidance that you've been given, this pattern shows up in all kinds of things. It shows up in the Bible. It shows up in history. It shows up in biographies. You'll see this a lot where somebody is given a direction. They don't do it. And until they circle back and fulfill that later down the timeline, then they don't get the next direction. So this is, again, being brutally honest with yourself. Nobody else is listening. Is there some direction that you can recall and remember that you were given that needs to be fulfilled? All right, here's another broad topic. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You guys know where I stand on this, but let's just kind of group into one things like, drugs, alcohol, or other substances that are not natural. We're talking about a natural, spiritual pipeline here. So here's another area where we can have an accumulation of things that really we know need to be purged that are not purged that are in the way, and they will block it. I thought of the Greek word pharmakeia. Sound familiar? Pharmacy? Pharmaceutical? Well, If you drill down on the meaning of the Greek word pharmakai, it is an abstract noun, so it's a noun, meaning sorcery, magic, the practice of magic arts. Isn't that interesting how that correlates to how we have adapted that as pharmaceutical? See, the Greek language, especially that the Bible was written in, is much more precise in its words than our English language are. We catch so many broader definitions. So the concrete noun pharmacon means poison primarily, first definition, poison. Second meaning is magic potion or charm to achieve a desirable objective. That complements pharmakai. And the third meaning is medicine, remedy, or drug for the purpose of healing. Well, All of these unnatural substances put us in that realm of sorcery, magic, practice of magic arts, and poison. I mean, I'm sorry, guys, but a lot of things that we ingest are poison in our system. Well, if we're trying to have the best spiritual connection and pipeline possible, poisons in our system will block it. That's as far as I'm going to go but you get the message. All right, now let's bring this home. So if you don't have the voice, perception, intuition on a daily, even case-by-case, hourly or less basis, like what Fred was talking about in episode 304, like what I was able to develop in Aspen, like being able to look at some food and just intuit by asking, is this my highest timeline to ingest at this time. If you don't have that, what can we do? I listed out a lot of things, and I know we're running long typically for one of my episodes, but let's go through these. All right, so number one, simply ask for it. You know, even in the Bible, it says you do not have because you do not ask. Well, take that to heart. And if you don't have it in all sincerity, simply ask for it. Ask that blocks be revealed to it. If I have a block, in all honesty with myself, please show me what it is. And give me the wisdom to turn it around. And I'll give you a hint on the block. Look the opposite direction. Go to Jerry Seinfeld. George does the opposite. Watch the YouTube video. It's about three or four or five minutes. Laugh and then do the opposite. I can't tell you how golden That little technique has been for me. Okay, another one, practice, 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 turning down the monkey mind. Telling the hammer, we're going to stand down. I want you to listen to the nail. Find that reversal point where the nail gets to not only stand up, but actually rise above the hammer, telling the hammer where to swing. 
I haven't ever used that analogy. It actually works quite well as we've continued it on here for the last 10 minutes or so. Yes, elevate the nail above the hammer. Hammer, swing here. Now here. Over here. Softer here. Harder here. I mean, and you get the idea. I mean, it can be a beautiful orchestra of direction, action, direction, action. That's what you're looking for. All right. Um, forget the numbering here, but number next, get the two audiobooks and listen to them all the way through. If you have started them before and didn't finish them, listen to them through three times each since we've blown our time. Let me tell you a quick story. <laughs> you know, I've mentioned my friend Hemet a lot uh, from Aspen. Hemet had been in the yoga community for some time, had developed his skill. He was doing his daily routine, his daily kundalini practice. He was at a retreat where Yogi Bhajan, the guy who brought it over from India, was present and was working through him at a breakup of a relationship that he had actually formed within the kundalini community. Well, this person ended up breaking his heart, and that happened to be the time that Hemet was there with Yogi Bhajan. So Yogi Bhajan told him some exercises to do, but he saw that that old pattern was there of resistance and that Hemet was going to be stewing on this for a while. So he said, you, don't do for one hour, you do three hours every day. Well, Hemet took his yoga seriously, and he got up. He was working at that time, so he went to bed two hours early so he could get up two extra hours before he normally would, and he did that yoga for a year for three hours a day. Changed his whole life. That's why I say, if you've started those books and, or any of the books and haven't finished them, like the guru would have said, three times for you, three times, you listen three times, and do all the exercises three times, make yourself do it. Love yourself that much. Here's another. Find your Zen zone, whatever that is, and enter it three times per week, at least. Be willing to do this work. Best if you can do it from your Zen zone, but do it at least get into that Zen zone three times per week and be working on this stuff in your life. All the stuff you've heard in this podcast, digging up the past, doing the opposite, all the journaling, all the meditating, all the praying, put it all together and do it with determination. Now, when you finally do get a connection, thank the connection. Thank it right there. Gratitude. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for showing me what it is like to connect with you. Thank you for appearing. And in that same moment, invite more. Here's what my little Colorado Trail conversation would have sounded like. Oh, wow. Hammer. That was awesome. Thank you for letting the nail speak for so long. Now, would you be willing to let the nail speak even longer? And nail, since you didn't get flattened out on the anvil like a pancake, are you willing to stand even taller and speak louder and speak more often? And you get that buy-in, sends chills up and down your spine. Then repeat what you were doing when it appeared. So get into that position of re-evaluating or recognizing the pattern. What was I doing? What, what released? What clicked? What happened? That this all of a sudden appeared and at least get yourself back into that state as often as you can. Do it calmly. Like Fred mentioned in his video, you have to approach this with empty hands. You have to come from a relaxed state. Don't get all excited about it. But celebrate the moment and then just invite more. This is living consciously. And then as that nail gets more and more confident and you keep talking to both sides of yourself and you negotiate the bargain of the nail taking the lead. And I love the example. So now the nail is just hovering magically above the hammer and it tells the hammer where to swing. Now you are living in your true power, guided by your higher self. And I certainly don't have any double-blind scientific study to back this up. But I would dare venture to guess that when you operate this way, 
your success rate is over 90%. This is where I say is if we could go to a casino and say, well, I've got a 90% formula at the blackjack table. Are you willing to take a chance on it? Well, that's to me what this is. It's a high probability of success every time because you are being guided at that point by your very sole purpose for being on the planet. This has been an amazing series, and look at what came to us when we set the intention to do this together. That video, the voice that my brother sent me, and then Fred dropping that muscle testing video at just the right time. So we're going to move on to some other areas now, but I think this gives you a really good package and some really good tools to implement. And as you're implementing them, always remember to enjoy the journey. Thank you so much for listening. Hopefully this series has helped. I'm Thomas Miller. We'll see you next time. The stories and opinions expressed on this podcast are independently those of the host and guests and are not intended to be taken as medical advice or to replace medical care from a licensed professional when appropriate.